Good evening and welcome to all of my dear students and friends. I hope you have been staying very healthy, happy and uh, obviously in high spirits and uh, preparing for your examination uh, with full dedication and hard work. As we discussed last day that uh, dreams plus dedication plus hard work leads to success, right? And in that view, we are going to discuss about the important MCQs and the name is MCQ Marathon because we are going to have a three hour session over here and we will try to discuss maximum questions and we will try to touch each and every topic from where the important MCQs are expected to be asked. Uh, so good evening Abdul, Arun, Bhushan, good evening, good evening Manjeet, yes. So good evening to all of my dear friends. So uh, let's not waste time and uh, we will start with our discussion. So guys, uh, I would like to request all of you to please ensure me about the audio video thing. Is everything okay at your end? Am I audible and the video is very clear to you? Just please do me a confirmation. Welcome Muhammad. Welcome Aju. Anji guys, I request you to please confirm me. Thank you Muhammad. So, these are some of the, uh, you know, uh, an academy is offering you. So you can subscribe upon an academy platform and you can get benefits. So kindly do subscribe for this lovely offers you can have, right? Okay. So again, guys, before I proceed further, do remember that how to approach an MCQ. It's very easy. Read the options first, then read the last line very carefully and then try to frame out a quick picture of the try to correlate that options with the last line and then obviously you can read that uh, whole question doing this you will definitely going to you know uh, get a right option in a very short time so let's go and with the first question you have uh, 45 seconds again as we discussed last day right so within these 45 seconds you have to read the options you have to read the question and then you have to answer appropriately so here is the first question and you have 45 seconds to read this. Welcome Vishesh, welcome Raman. Welcome Abdul. Ten seconds left, guys. Five seconds. Okay, so lovely answers, guys. You are giving me these are the options. Let's quickly go through these options. We have hypothermia, hyperkalemia, hypercalcemia, and thrombocytopenia. These are the options. And let's see what the question is. Which of the following is not a complication of massive red cell transfusion? Right? Okay, G. You have admitted a 60 year old patient with large volume hematemesis. He is a non case of primary biliary cirrhosis. Very important. With esophageal viruses, he is hemodynamically unstable with ongoing hematemesis. In last four hours, he has received multiple blood transfusions. Which of the following is not a red mass? Uh, which is of the following is not a complication of massive red cell transfusion? So let's quickly uh, go through this thing, guys. Hypothermia, yes, it can be a complication. It can be a complication. Why it can be a complication? Because if you give the refrigerated blood, if you give it a refrigerated blood without rewarming the blood, the patient may land up into hypothermia. So yes, hypothermia is one such condition. 
नाउ सीरम पोटेशियम लेवल इज फ्रिक्वेंटली रेज फॉलोइंग अ ब्लड सेल ट्रांसफ्यूजन डू रिमेंबर दिस थिंग द कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ द पोटेशियम इंक्रीजेस एज द लेंथ ऑफ द ब्लड बैग प्रोलॉन्ग्स एज द लेंथ ऑफ ब्लड और यू कैन से द ब्लड बैग लेंथ द स्टोर्ड ब्लड और आई एम जस्ट राइटिंग द स्टोर्ड ब्लड इंक्रीजेस इफ यू डोंट ट्रांसफ्यूज इट फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम देयर इज गोइंग टू बी अ हाइपर कैलिमिया नाउ आई एम जस्ट गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट थ्रोम्बोसाइटोपीनिया फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल yes thrombocytopenia is going to be a complication why it is going to be a complication because of the dilutional effect why beta because of dilutional effect right as rbcs they contain now it is saying it is not whole blood it is saying red cell transfusion so rbcs if you are giving rbcs they have a dilutional uh, platelets and they contain a low platelet in the rbcs right if uh, we are, you see we have a whole blood and we have an option of just giving rbcs so here in the question they are just talking about the rbcs so obviously the platelet level will be on a lower side so yes thrombocytopenia is going to be there now why hypercalcemia is going to be there do remember this thing my dear friend that in a healthy hepatically metabolize if a person is a healthy and uh, is having a good liver function of the liver is working normally do remember this thing that citrate basically metabolizes here in a healthy person citrate metabolizes metabolizes within few minutes over here in the liver but now you see my dear friend this patient is having primary biliary cirrhosis now i am telling you that if this patient is having a liver disease it means the citrate is not going to get metabolized properly and this citrate will do what beta this citrate will bind to calcium this will bind to calcium and this will cause hypocalcemia so what is going to be there hypercalcemia is not a complication rather hypocalcemia is going to be a there right so option c was the right answer right okay hello akhila akhil raj right okay so people who have given me c answer i clap for all of them let's go to question number 2 again you have 45 seconds Twenty seconds left, guys. Times up, guys. So, what are the options we have? Bone marrow biopsy, fine needle aspiration biopsy, lymph node biopsy, CT, neck, and chest. Which of the following is the most appropriate investigation to confirm the diagnosis? Now let's read the question. Fifty-year-old patient present to your clinic with rapidly enlarging lymph node on the right side of the neck. Very important history, right? Do tell me that what this patient is dealing with. If you are able to segregate the what is the diagnosis of this patient, trust me, guys, you will give me a right answer over here. Okay. Then uh, he is suffering from. he is also suffering from increasing night sweats over the past few weeks and lost 5 to 7 kg so weight loss is a significant history in the last 4 months on examination he looks pale another bmi is 23 he has a lymph node enlargement on both side of the neck and in his axilla he has normochromic normocytic anemia ldh is elevated so guys i do request you to please let me know that what is this patient dealing with what is this patient dealing with guys haan ji you have 10 seconds to answer what is this patient dealing with so majority of you people think it is going to be the c answer which is absolutely going to be the c answer is going to be the right because this patient you see if you correlate this history then you will find that this patient is going towards non hodgkins lymphoma 
non hodgkins lymphoma right and we know this thing that if there is a case of non hodgkins lymphoma right now in a non hodgkins lymphoma lymph node biopsy is always beneficial because it is going to tell us about the histological architecture of that lymph node tissues do remember this thing right now talking about you know bone marrow biopsy it is uh, you know or a needle aspiration biopsy right is not recommended as compared to you know uh, lymph node biopsy that will be more beneficial yes i do agree with the point if the people has yeah cancer okay hodgkins lymphoma yeah you can see like this thing lymph node biopsy lymphoma hiba i agree with your point uh, ct neck and chest will be beneficial i do agree with your point that ct neck and um, uh, you know uh, uh, ct neck and chest will at least going to tell us about the spread of the disease what they are going to tell us about the spread of the disease but my dear friend first of all you want to know about the histological architecture and where you are going to find you are just going to find upon the lymph node biopsy do remember this thing and then upon ct and based upon the lymph node biopsy you can go for a staging right okay yeah uh, there are basically you know uh, there are various scores if you can call it that various scores are also evaluated someone is asking that various scores are always there yeah these scores basically in you like age gender right and then uh, what do you call it as a functional status right main is number of lymph nodes involved more the score worse the prognosis number of lymph nodes involved right even ldh see ldh was increased over here if i remember yes ldh was increased over here right so who only recommends the use of lymph node biopsy to evaluate a non hodgkins lymphoma do remember this thing let's read to question number 3 45 second guys Five seconds left, guys. Times up. We have options: ciprofloxacin, co-amoxiclab, trimethoprim, amoxicillin. All right. Which of the following antibiotics associated with this condition? A twenty-year-old female has been diagnosed with urinary tract infection. She was prescribed a course of antibiotic for one week. Very important. From means last one week she was taking antibiotic for her condition. Uh, due rates for last five to six days. It's not due rates. It deteriorated. Deteriorated. Just a spelling mistake over here. Deteriorated from last five to six days. She also developed hematuria. Very important. Low backache, abdominal pain. Right. Okay. Lab report says HP means she is having anemia with evidence of hemolysis. Very very important. So all you have to remember that which are the drugs which are responsible to cause hemolysis and what is the cause of hemolysis if some patient is going with some antibiotics or with some drugs, right? So before I proceed further with this question, guys, I would like to know that what exactly this patient is having a basic problem. Do remember this thing, guys, that this clinical case scenario is basically a case scenario of drug induced hemolysis. First of all. do remember this thing that this patient why i am saying because this patient was already on some drugs 
and these drugs have must cause some drug induced drug induced hemolysis is there now what are the drugs which can cause hemolysis and why they can cause hemolysis probably this patient must have g6pd g6 pd deficiency right so we know this thing that there are certain drugs which can cause hemolysis and do remember this thing that the symptoms of hemolysis i repeat the symptoms of hemolysis they start within 1 to 3 days of the initiating of the drugs where do they start in within the 1 to 3 days of the start of the drug and do remember another important point that anemia when this hemolysis is on a severe level it takes approximately 7 to 10 days how much days beta 7 to 10 days here that what is the history is written over here that his condition is deteriorating from 5 to 6 days that approximately we can say a week time that this patient is landing up into hematuria and this hemolysis is occurring now some of the drugs particularly if i talk about ciprofloxacin which is going to be the right answer over here like drugs like nitrofurantoin nitrofurenation or nitrofurantoin right then sulfonamides sulfonamides and quinolones you know loans these all are the drugs which can go for g6pd hemolysis do remember this thing guys very very important in india practicing the ciprofloxacin is very common that's why we have purposely discussed this question that if any question came with hemolysis and you should be very aware of this thing that this patient is having g6pd deficiency and in that hemolysis can do occur over here and some of the drugs like nitrofurantoin sulfonamides and um, uh, you know quinolones are uh, well recognized causes for hemolysis right and you know what you have to do if they ask you that uh, what is the treatment for hemolysis first of all you have to stop the drug right stop the drug do remember this thing and this hemolysis is basically self limiting with a uh, uh, due time like 5 uh, to 7 days the patient will come back to its normal life right okay times up guys times up okay so we have options latex lesions on bone scan serum monoclonal protein 28 g per liter pathological fracture of the femur increased creatinine which of the following feature is not consistent with the diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance a 65 year old man present to you for regular checkup on routine blood testing you found to have para proteinemia very important right which of the following feature is not consistent with the diagnosis of mugs so guys first of all uh, you have given me answer c c c a okay c c c a you are giving me the answer but the correct answer is going to be the increase in creatinine why increase in creatinine is going to be the answer because we know that the monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance to make the diagnosis of this we have particular one criteria and what is this criteria first of all that the serum monoclonal proteins serum monoclonal protein smp i am just writing short form just to save the time serum monoclonal protein should be less than 30 g per liter so we have this as a right option over here right now they are asking which of the following is not consistent with the diagnosis they are asking not so serum monoclonal protein less than 
30 means this is a right answer over here another criteria we do have is this thing that the bone marrow plasma that we do have bone marrow plasma cells should be less than 10 percent do remember this thing should be beta how many should be less than 10 percent right then my dear friend there should be no myeloma related end organ no myeloma related end organ failure eof end organ failure or you can say tissue impairment right then my dear friend another features includes like lytic lesions very important lytic lesions right i think there was written something lytic lesions on the bone scan so this is going to be the right answer over here then patient can have anemia anemia right anemia 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 no it is not in the option anemia then hypercalcemia hypercalcemia right renal failure right so these are some of the this one and my dear friend the very important this thing is that this patient can have also fractures of the femur they can also present with the fracture of the femurs right okay ji Next question, you have 45 seconds again. Time's up guys, we have options, low dose corticosteroids, iron supplementation, azathioprine and splenectomy. Which of the following is the most appropriate management for him? An 18 year old boy presents to the clinic, he has splenomegaly which is causing him significant abdominal discomfort and he wants to consider for splenectomy. He says that his sister has underwent the operation in the previous year. On examination, he has mild tenderness, his, he is anemic. Spherocytosis are seen on the blood film, very important, right? The osmotic fragility test is positive, which of the following is the most appropriate management for him, guys. So, guys, first of all, can you please tell me what is this patient dealing with or what is the diagnosis of this patient? What is this patient suffering from? Hanji, can you please, someone can tell me, I can give a, uh, a packet of chocolate to that guy. What is this patient dealing with? Even here, the answer is written over here. And second clue is over here that he says that his sister has underwent operation. So it means I am just giving you a clue that there is something which has gone in the hereditary. So this patient is going to, yes, Arun Pandya Raj, absolutely right, Siddharth, absolutely right, we are doctor, absolutely right. So this patient is going under hereditary, is suffering from hereditary spherocytosis. Now, and secondly, he is a symptomatic patient. Why he is a symptomatic patient? Because you look at the hemoglobin level, he is having an HB level of 
9.2 gram per liter and he is suffering from some abdominal pain also abdominal discomfort is also there which has resulted because of this anemia and this abdominal pain has resulted from what beta it has resulted from splenomegaly right got my point now do understand this thing this age plays a very important role if this age would have 10 or less than 10 years my dear friend then obviously any doctor would have discouraged the splenectomy right below 10 years it is always recommendable not to do the splenectomy and it is managed with you know approximately with the folic acid supplementation so how do you remember this less than 10 years of age if the patient presents with hereditary spherocytosis folic acid supplementations are recommended right but now in the question the age is itself 18 years so obviously you can go for a right answer that is going to be a splenectomy right do remember this thing the important point of this thing they love to ask is this what are the complications of hereditary spherocytosis this is an important mcq or they may love to ask you right uh, muskan yeah you can correct the anemia but giving the splenectomy uh, by giving the folic acid supplementation beta but yeah it is given in 10 years of age that's what i have written 10 years of age over here do remember this thing right above that um, it is always recommended to go for a splenectomy right now another thing what are the complications can you please tell me what are the complications of hereditary spherocytosis Haanji. quickly guys jaldi jaldi boli what are the complications okay first of all there is an increased risk of hemolysis agreed anyone else yes then my dear friend there can be megaloblastic changes there can be a megaloblastic changes in folate deficiency in a folate deficiency right patient can have aplastic crisis particularly at the time of aplastic crisis particularly when the patient is having some viral infections particularly that of parvovirus parvovirus 19 infection right do remember this thing then patient is prone to develop what beta they prone to develop gallstones in approximately 50 percent of the patients you can find that the patient develops gallstones patient can go for you know uh, leg ulcerations also leg ulceration right if there are multiple blood transfusion as muskan you are asking that if there are multiple blood transfusions then there can be an overload right if multiple blood transfusions to correct the anemia if multiple blood transfusions another important is extra medullary hemopoiesis another complication is extra medullary hemopoiesis right okay so quickly revise about the complications right so complications include increased risk of hemolysis megaloblastic changes in polydeficiency a plastic crisis particularly when the patient goes in infective state and particularly if they ask about a virus that is parvovirus gallstones leg ulceration if there are multiple blood transfusions then there can be an overload extra medullary hemopoiesis can be seen also okay let's lead to question number six
टाइम्स अप गाइस टाइम्स अप वी हैव ऑप्शंस लाइक पीएसए लेवल फुल स्पाइनल एमआरआई स्कैन फुल स्पाइनल एक्सरे प्रोस्टेट बायोप्सी सो जस्ट रीडिंग एट द ऑप्शंस यू कैन फाइंड आउट दैट द पीएसए लेवल प्रोस्टेट बायोप्सी स्पाइनल एक्सरे और एमआरआई व्हाट दे आर डीलिंग विद दे आर गोइंग टू डील विद सम यू नो प्रोस्टेट स्पेसिफिक प्रॉब्लम्स ओवर देयर मे बी दिस पेशेंट हैज इन कैंसर व्हिच इज नाउ गोइंग इन अ मेटास्टेटिक फेज एंड वी नो दिस थिंग दैट प्रोस्टेट स्प्रेड्स थ्रू bones also may be through the uh, what do you call it spinal bones so let's read this question a 50 year old patient is admitted with symptoms of spinal cord compression see what i said is this thing just reading at the options he is a non case of prostate cancer which of the following is the most appropriate investigation in making rapid diagnosis read this word very carefully rapid diagnosis and management haan ji guys now can you please try to change your uh, this one option as of now i have just received one right answer and that is by hifa irfan right now you are saying full spinal mri scan i would like to know why you are going to choose option b why so why not prostate specific antigen level why not uh, you know people are saying that a prostate biopsy see guys first of all do remember this thing that this i told you that this patient is suffering from a prostate cancer and prostate cancer can metastasis can lead to metastasis so this is basically a metastatic led oncology emergency which needs to be addressed quickly guys on emergency basis first of all right now this patient has already gone into a spinal cord compression so if you don't release this compression if you are not going to treat this compression immediately this patient may go land up into the loss of the lower limb right got my point he may land up into hemiplegia right first of all do remember this thing okay bajendra i do b okay right so first of all mri whole spine is carried out as soon as possible for this condition to plan out the most appropriate treatment now let's talk about this full spinal x ray or uh, you know uh, if uh, even um, in the option it is written a ct scan or something like this thing right spinal x ray or either ct scans can give they don't actually give so accurate you know images of the spine this is the only mri which can actually give the accurate images of the spine and actual compression of the spine and so that you can treat the problem uh, quickly do remember this thing that prostate specific antigen and psa biopsy they help in making the diagnosis they help in making what better they help these both they help in making the diagnosis and they help in monitoring the treatment they help in what beta monitoring the treatment of prostate cancer but the concern over here is this that this patient was having what this patient was having a spinal cord compression and this needs to be looked out into uh, into an urgently basis got my point so do remember this thing that over here if spinal cord compression is written full spinal mri needs to be done absolutely right hipa i really appreciate your knowledge yeah you said already that the patient is a non case of prostate cancer see hipa we said this patient is already a non case of prostate cancer so why you are going to check for prostate level and prostate biopsy i have told you the same thing that it is just going to tell us about the diagnosis and it is going to tell us about the monitoring of the treatment how effective the treatment is going on right times up guys times up we have options extra thoracic lymph node biopsy bronchoscopy and biopsy 
कॉन्ट्रास्ट एनहांस कंप्यूटर टोमोग्राफी चेस्ट एक्सरे वट इन्वेस्टिगेशन विच इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज बेस्ट टू कन्फर्म द डायग्नोसिस अ ट्वेंटी फोर ईयर ओल्ड पेशेंट प्रेजेंट्स विद ब्रेथलेसनेस हेड एक विद विच वर्सन विच वर्सन ऑन लीनिंग फॉरवर्ड एंड हैड रिक्रेंट्स एंड कोपल एपिसोड वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट राइट ऑन एग्जामिनेशन ही हैज अ साइनोटिक अपियरेंस विद वीनस डिस्टेंशन ऑफ द फेस एंड अपर बॉडी वट इन्वेस्टिगेशन इज बेस्ट टू कन्फर्म द डायग्नोसिस सो बिफोर यू प्रोसीड गाइज मुस्कान वाई यू वॉन्ट टू डू ब्रोंकोस्कोपी एंड बायोपसी ओके वाई यू वॉन्ट टू डू राइट अरुण पांडे सर यू आर सींग एक्स्ट्रा क्लासिक लिंक नोट बायोपसी बी बी सी ए सोनाली सिंह यू आर सींग ए एंड यू आर ऑल्सो सींग बी नो नो बेटा यू डोंट हैव टू चूज फिफ्टी फिफ्टी यू हैव टू चूज वन so now you are using b also right okay so before you proceed to this answer or the option i would like to know that what exactly you are thinking this patient is having what what is this case of haan ji what is this case diagnosis kya banta hai what which investigation is best to confirm the diagnosis right although you haven't made diagnosis but you must be thinking na can you please tell me so guys if you read carefully that this patient is having breathlessness headache and worsens on leaning forward and recurrent syncopal episode right do remember this thing that these are the clinical features where you can suspect a case of superior vena cava obstruction superior vena cava obstruction svc obstruction do remember this thing so this is a case of superior vena cava obstruction now my dear friend what are the differential diagnosis of this thing what are the differential diagnosis of this thing the differential diagnosis over here is this that you can think about some primary lung cancer one thing you can think of primary lung cancer so now i really appreciate baljender i really appreciate your knowledge so you have to make the differential diagnosis like primary lung cancer malignancies right especially like a, a small cell carcinoma one thing second my dear friend there can be some lymphoma there can be a lymphoma right and a rare cause of all these things can sometimes goiter can also present like this thing right but now my dear friend there is no evidence of strider or laryngeal edema right so a definitive diagnosis should be sorted out before the treatment is started right okay people who are thinking that bronchoscopy is going to be the answer my dear friend if you are suspecting a superior vena cava obstruction then i don't go for this i will not go for this option and biopsy because i know this thing that there will be a higher risk of bleeding why beta i will not go over here there will be higher risk of bleeding i won't do this thing right so if i take bronchoscopy and biopsy post bronchoscopy and biopsy there will be higher risk of bleeding so i don't want to put this so i will just stick to one thing that this is extra thoracic lymph node biopsy from here i will try to rule out all the differential diagnosis got my point yes muskan it is scc small cell carcinoma svc absolutely right guys absolutely adorable okay times up guys times up breathlessness on mild exertion long diastolic murmur resting tachycardia low diastolic pressure below given is not a sign of severe aortic regurgitation very simple very simple guys quickly tell me okay muskan i do agree low diastolic pressure
लो डायस्टोलिक बीपी ओके डी यू आर सही ओके गाइज रीड दिस क्वेश्चन इट इज दे आर आस्किंग सीवियर एटिक रिगर्जिटेशन नॉट माइल्ड यू नो एटिक रिगर्जिटेशन so now you can would you like to change your option i have focused upon severe aortic regurgitation see my dear friend a long murmur is actually first of all the answer is going to be this one this is the b is going to be the right answer by b is going to be the right answer because a long diastolic murmur is basically an acute sign of mild aortic regurgitation it is only seen in mild aortic regurgitation i'm just ar i am writing aortic regurgitation now what happens my dear friend right what happens because in severe aortic regurgitation as in uh, this one in severe aortic regurgitation the ventricular pressure the ventricular pressure it rises so rapidly during a diastole phase it increases rapidly it rises rapidly during a diastolic phase or diastolic filling phase whatever you want to call to cause a large regurgitant volume right and in return when this fills what happens basically my dear friend it reduces the pressure gradient so because of this filling rapid filling of this diastolic phase what will happen there will be a reduction in the pressure gradient there will be a reduction in the beta pressure gradient between aorta and ventricle and this will lead to what beta it will rapidly due to this there will be a rapid decline or rapidly slowing we call it of murmur and this murmur will be lost somewhere in the this murmur it lost somewhere in what you call it as uh, in mid diastole right so when this murmur is lost in the mid diastole how this is going to be a long diastolic murmur so let me explain you once more what is this basic phenomena do remember this thing that long diastolic murmur is only seen in the aortic regurgitation in mild aortic regurgitation what happens in severe aortic regurgitation is this that the ventricular pressure increases very rapidly when it increases so rapidly it means there will be a uh, you know diastolic fillet will increase to a large regurgitant volume this volume will decrease the pressure gradient between the aorta and the ventricles and this will lead to a rapid slowing or of the murmur and due to this there will be a loss of this murmur in the mid diastolic phase itself so the answer was what beta long diastolic murmur yes resting phase tachycardia low diastolic pressure breathlessness mild exertion all are associated with a severe aortic regurgitation right okay ji is it okay now visible
10 second guys 10 seconds times up a 60 year old male is di- okay let me read the options first persistent murmur lengthening fear interval enlarging vegetation rising esr right which of the following is an indication for urgent surgery 60 year old male is diagnosed with subacute bacterial endocarditis very important i am just zooming so that we can read the question very comfortably endocarditis he haven't visited the dentist for many years and is suffering from a lethargy night sweat anorexia for the last few weeks on examination his heart rate is 88 per minute regular blood pressure is little on a higher side uh temperature yes he is febrile he has a pan systolic murmur do important pan systolic murmur in the mitral area and these lab reports are very important hv is this thing so this guy is in a sepsis because the tlc count is 14000 normal what is the value normal tlc is 4000 to 10000 do remember this thing 4 to 10000 is the normal value over here but here it is increased platelets are normal sodium is normal potassium is normal serum creatinine is normal near normal you can see esr is little increase yes because the tlc counts are normal and why this patient is already in sepsis there are two three things which is indicating about the sepsis one there is a febrile state second my dear friend you can see that this patient is having a increase in the tlc level right and third you can see that this patient is having what this patient is having what better this patient having is increase of esr level the important thing is this ecg is having a prolonged pr interval the pr interval was on a prolonged side mitral valve your mitral valve it's not well i don't know why there are so spelling mistakes well vegetation after giving antibiotic therapy for 14 days which of the following is an indication for urgent surgery so you are giving me the answers answers c c c c aisha you are giving me lengthening pr interval bushan b b so you are giving me these two options as the right answer so we are taking out this thing rising esr is not an indication of urgent surgery or persistent mr is not an indication now let me take out these two option a and d if you have to choose one among b and c why you are going to choose b or why you are going to choose c so you can rethink now guys you can tell me that what is the indication guys han ji you have 10 seconds to write down so guys you have 10 seconds to write down what is the indication okay do remember this thing one thing very clearly over here that the answer is going to be the in lengthening of the pr interval now why lengthening or increase in the pr interval is the right answer over here because here if there is an increase in the pr interval it is going to tell us that the probability of extension there can be an extension or spread of the infection spread of the infection into the myocardium into the myocardium right so if this infection is spreading and we are knowing from the ecg itself and even the counts are increasing right then obviously my dear friend it is suggestive that this patient is going to have what myocardial abscess this patient is going to land up into a myocardial abscess formation got my point so guys the answer is going to be the uh baljinder vegetation can cause embolism therefore need to pay attention ha huh, beta i do agree with this point that vegetation can cause embolism but you have um, you know thrombolytics you can give some heparin or warfarin also you can still you know uh, uh, deal with this infection first right but if 
fear is already started prolonging that means this patient is going to develop this abscess once this myocardial abscess is formed try trust me guys this is going to spread throughout the body through hematogenous spread and the patient is going to in a very severe kind of sepsis and the prognosis of survival will be very less so do remember that urgently you have to go for a surgery and then you can help this patient out Muskan, please read this question again. Yeah, forty five second, guys. Yeah, already you have given me the right answer. So we know that this thing that which of the following medication needs to be avoided? Yes, guys, we know the answer is. Yes, what is the right answer over here? We know that this remipril is right answer over here. This is contraindicated. The ACE inhibitors are contraindicated in pregnancy. Why they are contraindicated in pregnancy? Because my dear friend, they can lead to the renal failure of the fetus. One thing, renal failure of fetus. Important thing, right? They can cause oligohydrominosis. right so we know that this methyl dopa is also used as the first line drug to control the blood pressure right secondly we can also use hydralazone maybe it can be used in emergency crisis where that methyl dopa or levetolol is not available got my point so methyl dopa levetolol and uh, hydralazone can be used but yes ace inhibitors cannot be used Time's up guys, we have options like Oxaki virus, Epstein's bar virus, influenza A virus, adenovirus. Which of the following is the most likely cause? A 25 year old athlete comes to emergency room, he ran a half marathon a few days earlier despite he was suffering from symptoms of cold and now has shortness of breath and is unable to exercise. Okay. On examination his blood pressure is 90 by 58 and heart rate is 94 per minute. So this gives us a lot of things over here right and this is a athlete patient right okay he has bilateral crackles and mild ankle swelling you suspect myocarditis which of the following is the likely cause so obviously it be correlate with this thing and we know that this patient is having a myocarditis of which myocarditis this coxsackie virus is the most common etiological organism or you can say virus right it is the recognized viral cause to cause myocarditis right now 
this coxsackie can also cause some of the uh, other problems such as you know it can precipitate sarcoidosis i am saying it can precipitate sarcoidosis it can precipitate sle right so what you do my dear friend all you have to give if you have encountered this case of uh, you know myocarditis with coxsackie virus what treatment you are going to give my dear friend you are just going to treat the heart failure first of all like you are going to give the diuretics you are going to give ace inhibitors right so here you can give diuretics and you can give ace inhibitors and obviously you are going to recommend physical rest means physical inactivity for a number of months post diagnosis so this how you are going to take this patient under the treatment okay ji so yes it was answer a okay read the question carefully guys guys you are saying me option d i don't agree with option d no i do agree with your point that stenosis so nally you are saying stenosis more than 90% coronary intervention should be done okay uh, mithu why you are saying a why you are saying a as the mithu sir uh, mithu kumar you are saying a as the right answer over here can you please tell me why rest of the people are saying d so guys there is a patient 55 year old patient presents with a history of angina for last one year so do remember this thing this patient is having a stable angina first of all this patient is having what beta stable angina do remember this thing he reports that his work is limited to approximately 250 meters angiography suggestive of 90% of stenosis in his coronary artery which of the following treatment most beneficial for his prognosis do remember this thing they are just telling you about the prognosis okay now you are saying me that guys like this thing percutaneous coronary intervention i do agree with this point that yes percutaneous intervention is required i don't deny with this point that it is required over here but my dear friend i still will go for initial first i am going to start with lisinopril then only after this i am going to start this percutaneous intervention immediately but first they are asking most beneficial for his prognosis although i do agree with your point that percutaneous intervention is required i am not denying this thing guys but here the question is asking that prognosis even after giving the pci if i don't start beta blocker the prognosis are not going to be of beneficial thing and secondly my dear friend do remember this thing ace inhibitors can also be have shown some effect with vascular diseases who are not having you know uh, what you call it as people who are living patients without left ventricular dysfunction 
राइट एस इनिबिटर्स आर ऑल्सो बेनिफिशियल राइट बट फर्स्ट यू कैन स्टार्ट बीटा ब्लॉकर्स और एस इनिबिटर्स देन ऑब्वियसली यू कैन गो फॉर परकुटेनियस इंटरवेंशन इज रिक्वायर्ड ओके जी so guys here the question is not that what is the next step do remember this thing they are not asking you had it been a question that they would have asked what is the following treatment will be the most i am if i am deleting this next step then obviously i would have gone for this answer number d but here let's read this question carefully and what they are asking from us that what is this for their prognosis and prognosis will always be defined with a drug like beta blockers or if the ace inhibitors have been given like this thing right okay so do read this question carefully See guys, I do agree. This is a little. It looks easy. It looks easy, but it actually not easy. If on a scale of ten, then the toughness of this question is approximately nine or nine plus because here they are asking about prognosis, and you get confused. What is the next step of the management? If the next step of the management, and obviously your answer D was the right answer to tell the prognosis. Obviously, I have to give the drug. Right. and guys the best part of this thing when you will come from the exam you will be in a impression that sir we have given a right answer right so when we will rediscuss this question this type of question then we will obviously uh, you know analyze this question and then you will feel low so don't try to be in a rush stay calm read the line very carefully and then only answer okay चलो क्वेश्चन नंबर थर्टीन करते हैं थैंक यू दीपक थैंक यू टेन सेकेंड लेफ्ट गाइस Okay, times up, guys. We have options: beta blocker, alpha blocker, dihydropyridine, calcium antagonist. Right? No add-on medicines is required. So, where basically we use beta blocker, alpha blocker, or option C, we use to treat the hypertension. So, let's read this question. Right? Okay. What is the most appropriate add-on medication? That is the question. Basically, a 50-year-old patient visits you for a management of hypertension. See. now what i why i am saying you to read this question uh, options carefully you can code it basically where the question is going on so just looking at the options you can tell these drugs are used to treat the hypertension so that what is written in the first line his previous history is a uh, medical history is unremarkable he is taking remipril bendroflu mithazai on examination his blood pressure is 140 oblique 90 so it is you you know if this patient is a 50 year old patient we have you know jnc guidelines for hypertension and you know what you call it as that nice guidelines for hypertension we have two guidelines right according to them this is a good 
controlled blood pressure at this age and his family physician has obtained a similar reading on the previous two occasions ecg showing left ventricular hypertrophy serum electrolyte so this is important guys now please focus over here lvh is there cause of hypertension lvh right left ventricular hypertrophy right okay serum electrolytes potassium 4.9 so it is slight a normal borderline you can say a borderline limit this is a borderline limit over here you can see that this normally we have how much potassium 3.5 to 4.5 so it is a borderline right what is the most appropriate add-on medication so you people are giving me the answer c d c d c d why not a and b why not guys although the right answer is going to be what better the right answer is going to be this one that you have to start dye hydropyramidine calcium antagonist right although in this question the bp is not on a higher side first of all right and but my dear friend there is an damage end organ damage where in the form of left ventricular hypertrophy that it has suggested that we have to keep the blood pressure less than 140 90 not on 140 90 but to maintain the blood pressure less than 140 90 now as i told you the gnc guidelines and particularly i'm talking about the nice guidelines for hypertension which guidelines better nice guidelines for hypertension they have clearly recommended that after a use of ace inhibitor already the patient was taking remipril right or arb let's say i'm just writing over here after the use of ace inhibitor right or arb or a thiazide or a thiazide the next step should be always to start what beta dry hydropyridine calcium antagonist right now after this obviously you can then start what you can always recommend the third this was the first this was the second line then my dear friend you can always go for third and fourth option that is what beta alpha blocker or beta blockers got my point right okay right so you got my point so what you have to revise guys you have to revise what you have to revise these guidelines what guidelines nice guidelines or you can also go for j and c guidelines you can download from the internet and you can quickly go through this thing because this is an important question based upon the hypertension okay let's see to question number 14 now guys read the question carefully don't be in a rush don't be in a rush they are asking the most likely physical finding most likely physical finding in this patient guys see this is again a tricky question you may get confused i am telling you yes now i have received one right option okay times up also so tachycardia signs of pulmonary edema pericardial rub steep wide descent of jugular venous pulse okay uh, so basically where do we see all these things so basically we see all these things either in a case of tamponade or maybe in some kind of you know uh, what you call it as frederick sign or some constructive pericarditis so you just have to quickly revise all these things now let's read the question 
A 55 year old female presents with three months history of worsening of shortness of breath. Chest X-ray shows cardiomegaly. Echocardiography normal cardiac functions. Global pericardial effusion very important. Global pericardial effusion with evidence of tamponade. Why haven't you read this line, my dear friend? The people who are giving me the answer C, D, or something else, right? Please read this line carefully. Evidence of tamponade. So this patient is having cardiac tamponade. And you have to just answer that the most likely physical finding associated with this patient. Obviously, the answer is going to be the tachycardia. The commonest physical finding in the patient order of cardiac tamponade is first tachycardia. The first commonest and the most common finding is what beta? It is going to be the tachycardia. And then this patient is going to have after this tachycardia, this patient is will have. So I'm just writing increase in heart rate as tachycardia then patient will have increased in jvp jugular pressure with small sign patient will have small sign later because my dear friend you can see this patient is having a global pericardial effusion as this effusion will lead further or it will progress further right then patient will develop hypotension And this hypotension will finally land up into a low cardiac output. This is going to land up into a low cardiac output. So how this tamponade is going to work? This is going to give you these clinical findings over here. Or do remember this thing. Tachycardia will be a reflex tachycardia over here. Then hypotension. Now you can correlate hypotension and tachycardia. Got my point? Okay. People who are giving me C as the option, my dear friend, right? Now do remember this thing that pericardial rub, you don't expect a pericardial rub because the fluid is separating the two layers, right? The fluid is going to separate the two layers of the pericardium, right? And the people who are thinking that steep wide descent of the jugular venous pulses. So what is this called as? This is called as what beta? This is called as Steve Y pulses, this is called as fried rich sign. And this fried rich sign or Steve Y descent, one of the same thing, it's basically seen in where? In constrictive pericarditis. It is mainly seen in where? Constrictive pericarditis. Got my point? Obviously, Muskan, you will, you will have. So guys, very simple question. Scleroderma, hemochromatosis, myotonic dystrophy, sarcoidosis. Which of the following is not associated with the restrictive cardiomyopathies? You have 10 seconds, guys. Okay, absolutely right guys. This hem scleroderma, hemochromatosis, sarcoidosis, all are a feature of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Whereas this C is myotonic dystrophy is not associated with uh, restrictive myopathy. Right, so whereas scleroderma particularly it is seen with non-infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Right, sarcoidosis and some amyloidosis also seen. Amyloidosis is also seen, right. Then Febreze is also seen, Febreze disease and hemochromatosis is also seen with the restrictive cardiomyopathy. Very simple. I think you know this answer very carefully. 
and you revise this answer also in a good manner okay guys this question looks easy but do read this question very carefully right guys right 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 let's read the question it is more common among females frequently associated with early onset coronary atherosclerosis associated with scarring and uh, construction of ascending aorta more commonly associated with aortic regurgitation than mitral regurgitation which of the following is associated with ankylosing spondylitis we know this thing that ds this is not the right answer why this is not the right answer because my dear friend this is most common in where it is more common in males and in which males young males what is the age group approximately the young males aging between 20 to 30 year or let's say second to third decade this is most common got my point frequently associated with early onset of atherosclerosis atherosclerosis it is basically associated with coronary artery disease so basically what happens beta this ankylosing spondylitis is basically associated with early onset of coronary artery disease not with atherosclerosis early onset of coronary artery diseases right and this coronary artery disease can also lead to what beta coronary artery aneurysm also it can also lead to coronary artery aneurysm right so that is also over here okay so we are left with this option more common is associated with aortic regurgitation than mitral regurgitation yes this is going to be the right answer over here that aortic regurgitation is one of the most common cardiovascular complication of of what beta of ankylosing spondylitis and it ranges between 1 to 10 percent of the people or the patients right whereas this mitral regurgitation is a very rare complication right despite the fact that there can be an occasional mitral valve thickening yes there is a mitral valve thickening but the prevalence of mitral valve thickening as compared to uh, what you call it as a, this um, aortic regurgitation is very less so the right answer is going to be the d answer yes it is associated with hla b27 okay let me ask you one thing if you want to know very good although at your level i am pretty sure they are not going to ask you this prevalence right how many percentage of the people have HLA B27 positive? Hanji, my question is this. You are saying that ankylosing spondylitis is HLA B27 positive. I do agree with your point. You have said me very well. Absolutely do agree with this point. Yes, they are positive. But how much is, how many of the patients are um, uh, actually positive? Guys, you must be wondering that only 1 to 2 percent of the patients, only 1 to 2 percent of the whole patient coming with ankylosing spondylitis, they show HLA B27 positive. Right? Okay. But trust me, they are not going to ask you this, uh, you know, depth level of question just to add on your knowledge. Okay.
टाइम्स अप गाइस साइनस नोड री एंट्री टेकी गाड़ियां एट्रियो वेंट्रिकुलर नोडल री एंट्री टेकी गाड़ियां कैथे कलामाइन सेंसिटिव वेंट्रिकुलर टेकी गाड़ियां एट्रियल फ्लटर विद 2 रेशियो 1 एट्रियो वेंट्रिकुलर ब्लॉक हां जी व्हिच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग अरिथमिया डजंट गेट्स टर्मिनेटेड बाय इंट्रावेनस एडिनोसिन वेरी सिंपल आई होप यू हैव रेड दिस इन फार्माकोलॉजी इन मेडिसिन आल्सो so i am expecting a right answer from you guys 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 come on come on come on guys now do remember this thing okay just let me quickly help you by just drawing a picture over here so you can answer me a right राइट सपोज बेटा दिस इज एस ए नोड एंड दिस इज ए बी नोड लेट्स टेक इट लाइक दिस थिंग एंड देन वी हैव बंडल ऑफ फेज दिस इज बंडल ऑफ फेज वी डू हैव व्हाट बेटा वी डू हैव इज वन थिंग इज दिस थिंग दिस इज कॉल्ड एज द परकंजे फाइबर और बंडल ब्रांचेस ओवर हियर एंड वी नो दिस थिंग दैट व्हाट वी नो दिस थिंग इज दिस दैट हियर द मेजॉरिटी ऑफ द टाइम एस ए नोड हैज हाई इंपल्सेस इट हैज वेरी ग्रेटर impulses right it has greater impulses then ab node has less impulses and obviously this has more of contractions this ventricle have more of contraction got my point now my dear friend you can simplify this thing and you just have to revise your basic knowledge and from this basic knowledge you just have to tell me that where this adenosine basically works over here got my point you just have to tell me where this adenosine works over here okay do remember this thing i have just i am trying to tell you what i am trying to tell you is this thing that this adenosine basically works over here where it basically blocks this adenosin adenosin it blocks the conduction in av node conduction in the av node do remember this thing it is going to block the conduction in the av node right so in contest with any atrial flutter this will aid by revealing a atrial flower but unlikely it is going to terminate the arrhythmias do remember this thing now if you talk about the atrioventricular reentry tachycardia it is a reentry circulatory tachycardia within the av which is terminated by the adenosine so yes it is going to get terminated by the adenosine one thing do remember this thing right then my dear friend this what you call it as catecholamine sensitive uh, ventricular tachycardia where do you see this this you see in where you see this basically in a young athletic patients who are having a normal structure of the heart right now these tachycardias are basically prone to develop when the patient is doing some excessive physical activity right and these also do respond to adenosine right so what doesn't respond to adenosine is this that this atrial flutter with 2 ratio 1 atrio ventricular is not going to be reverted back by the iv adenosine it is not going to get terminated by the iv adenosine rest all these things they are going to be taken care by the adenosine okay yeah it blocks so beta i have explained you over here na
टाइम्स अप गाइस वी हैव डेल्टिया जेम एमिया ड्रोन वेरपोमेल कैरोटिड साइनस मसाज सो जस्ट बेस्ड अपॉन दिस ऑप्शंस व्हाट डू यू थिंक दैट दिस पेशेंट इज हैविंग व्हाट बेटर आई थिंक दिस पेशेंट इज गोइंग टू हैव यू नो सम टैकीकार्डिया मे बी वेंट्रिकुलर टैकीकार्डिया और मे बी सम काइंड ऑफ वेट्रियल टैकीकार्डिया आई कैन थिंक बिकॉज़ आई नो ऑल दीस ड्रग्स आर यूज्ड पर्टिकुलरली इफ आई लुक एट द ऑप्शन डी ओवर दिस ऑप्शन आई पर्टिकुलरली रिमेंबर that yes i have read and i have taught you also this thing while uh, we had a class of uh, you know acls that how to manage the tachycardia so you just have to think accordingly now let's read the question a 25 year old male is admitted to the emergency department after a history of cocaine abuse and amphetamine tablet which he took in a party following which he started feeling dizziness on admission his blood pressure is 110 by 50 okay this is having a reasonable blood pressure normal blood pressure you can say uh, and his uh, ventricular rate is 145 now this is not normal this is not normal ecg paroxysmal atrial tachycardia very good which of the following is the most appropriate initial therapy for this thing so guys let me answer you very quickly over here that when the patient is having a, a reasonable preserved blood pressure always try to go for a vagal maneuver first of all right before going for a you know aggressive drug therapy right if so ever after doing a carotid sinus massage you don't achieve the heart rate to get reduced or if the you know atrial tachycardia is not uh, slow down then you can also give a you know uh, crushed ice swelling of the crushed ice is going to also help this thing right but if both the thing that you know that uh, vagal stimulation by the carotid sinus massage or even on um, giving that um, uh, swallowed crust ice is not going to help obviously then my dear friend you are going to choose all the drugs which are given in this option then my dear friend obviously i am going to go for deltiazem or amiodron or verapamil they are going to be equally effective over here okay beta blocker beta do remember this thing beta blocker so this patient is having a atrial tachycardia so why don't you go for a carotid sinus massage right don't you think this will help first before going into a pharmacological therapy and they are asking what beta read this line carefully what is the initial treatment right so initial treatment beta or initial therapy is going to be the carotid sinus massage only after that obviously you are going to shift to a pharmacological management quickly guys this is a very uh, quick question times up for this question muskan medicine is not difficult right trust me medicine is very uh, loveable subject it only requires a uh, dedication and little bit of time that is it if you can come have a good command upon medicine there is nothing like this thing you will be the you know show stopper of your hospital or of your surroundings muskan what is your question sir ji isn't it one for which question you are asking beta can you please write in the chat box okay let me have this discussion upon this question the following condition doesn't cause a reverse split second heart sound very simple my dear friend all the abnormalities except this pulmonary stenosis all these abnormalities except this pulmonary stenosis they cause a reverse split of the second heart sound and whereas this pulmonary stenosis causes a wide split it causes what beta a wide 
split of second heart sound wide split of second heart sound where as the all these patent ductus arteriosus auto stenosis at left bundle branch block they causes a reverse split second heart sound very important to know this thing right okay times up guys they should not be given in patients with glaucoma reduce the production of nitric oxide contraindicated in constructive pericarditis should be avoided in anterior myocardial infarction which of the following best describe the use of oral and sublingual nitrates in clinical practice okay so guys they are just asking about oral and sublingual nitrates in clinical practice do remember this thing that these are contraindicated in constrictive pericarditis very simple why they are contraindicated in constrictive pericarditis because they are going to reduce the diastolic filling right they are going to reduce nitrates are going to reduce the diastolic filling they are going to reduce what better diastolic filling right and this will release to further decrease in the cardiac output they are going to lead in the further cardiac output in patients particularly with constrictive pericarditis yes they can be safely used in glaucoma they reduce the production of nitric oxide right and should be avoided in anterior myocardial infarction oral and sublingual it's basically i don't think so it is given in anterior myocardial infarction right it is not avoided so i don't think so that this is the right option there should be in use in anterior myocardial infarction right so it is not avoided guys i think there was a printing mistake should not be avoided in anterior myocardial infarction so yes you can uh, give this thing so uh, people who were giving me d as the answer they were also correct over here because i skip to read this avoided so if i remove this avoided should be given in anterior myocardial infarction now yes they can be given in or should not be i don't know how to frame it because i just received the mcqs okay so they should not be given in a patients with glaucoma they can be given reduce the production of nitric oxide contraindicated in constrictive pericarditis okay
Muskan D, I don't know what, what was that option. I didn't go through actually. You know, it was a previous year question. So basically, just uh, I'm going back with this question over here. Should be used or not used? I don't know. Uh, should be avoided. They are saying in interior myocardial infarction. So basically, if you talk about the glycerol trinitrate, Muskan, I am just addressing your question over here, beta. This glycerol trinitrate sublingual sprays are used to relieve the chest pain in a case of anterior myocardial infarction. what my point but do remember this thing that nitrates they can aggravate the symptoms if the patient is having hocm hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy only that condition they will do a reduction in the left ventricular volume got my point that's what i was talking about i hope dr muskan i got your point clear now okay let's see this question now Okay, guys. So we have ventricular septal defect, atrial septal defect, congenital aortic stenosis, Fallot's tetralogy. 18 year old male visits you for a medical examination in view of visa application. So one thing is very clear from this option that this patient didn't had any problem. He just visited or walked in just in a routine because he wanted to apply a visa for any country. And we know this thing prior to any application of the visa, we have to undergo a medical examination, right? on examination you find a loud systolic murmur so this is an incidental finding right otherwise the patient was normal that what the examiner is telling us he reports that he has been present since uh, it has been this has been present since infancy but he have been a healthy child and achieved all milestone with normal time no abnormality is detected what is the likely diagnosis guys so what is the likely diagnosis guys yes obviously if on the likely diagnosis is ventricular septal defect now this ventricular septal defect is the most common congenital heart condition particularly when a child is a small or in growing age and some more why i am saying because this patient is basically a hemodynamically stable patient right now my dear friend this murmur of bsd they tend to be very loud they tend to be very loud they are harsh murmur and particularly there is a harsh systolic murmur harsh systolic murmur right and sometimes they are associated with a thrill also they are also associated with a thrill beta right and what when they are associated with this thrill what do we call it as we call it as mala uh, what do you call it is mala di d roger right when this murmur is harsh loud systolic murmur associated with um, uh, a thrill this is called as malady roger now fallot's tetralogy is not the answer beta fallot's d is not the answer why d is not the answer because this condition leads to a cyanotic condition although i do agree with this point that this is also a loud murmur you can see in a fallot's or tetralogy of fallot right but this is a cyanotic condition whereas in this question there is nothing that is suggestive of any cyanosis right asd beta asd basically causes a loud systolic murmur right this can cause a basically uh, systolic flow murmur this is also very loud
got my point okay ji हाँ जी गई टेन सेकेंड लेफ्ट रीड द क्वेश्चन केयरफुली गाइज दिस इज अगेन अ ट्रिकी क्वेश्चन ओके टाइम्स अप आई बी नाइट्रेट्स ड्यूटाम ऑरल बीटा ब्लॉकर आई बी फेरासी माइट पेशेंट हु इज अ नॉन केस ऑफ पुअर लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकुलर फंक्शन प्रेजेंट्स टू यू विद हाइपर टेंशन एक्यूट पलमरी एडिमा राइट हाइपर टेंशन एंड एक्यूट पलमरी एडिमा ही हैव नो वेलबुलर हार्ट डिजीज वट इज द मोस्ट एप्रोप्रिएट इमीजिएट मैनेजमेंट वट इज द मोस्ट एप्रोप्रिएट इमीजिएट मैनेजमेंट डू रिमेंबर दिस थिंग दैट दिस पेशेंट इज हैविंग pulmonary edema means this patient is having what beta this patient is having a heart failure so the most effective treatment is to improve what beta to improve the cardiac output co i am just trying to improve the cardiac output and to reduce the left ventricular filling pressure left ventricular filling pressure your aim is to reduce the cardiac output and to reduce the left ventricular pressure and how you are going to do this you are going to reduce what you are going to reduce the after load now can you please tell me how you are going to achieve in a best way haan ji now among the options you can choose the best thing over here Okay, Muskan, I agree. As you are saying, as ferrocemide will also relieve the patient edema, no valvular heart disease, so need of nitrates. Beta, I do agree that ferrocemide can be given over here, but if you are going to reduce the, you know, after load, it can be best achieved by IV nitrates, right? So IV nitrates, even you know, you can give some ACE inhibitors, also can be given, right? Now. it's written oral beta blockers what you are thinking so iv beta blockers are more beneficial than oral beta blockers then uh, you know uh, among oral and iv iv uh, beta blockers will be this thing right iv would be the first line therapy in patients with acute heart failures guys you think that diuretics are the best treatment or the most appropriate treatment if nitrates are available among if you do a comparison between iv nitrates and iv uh, you know uh, diuretics then guys do remember this thing that diuretics are not going to be the best treatment they are not going to be the best treatment because in a case of acute heart failure there the patient is not likely to 
you know salt and water overload and the whole point of view is this there the patient can land up into accumulation of fluid in a wrong places like in pulmonary edema right beta yahan pe patient kya hai jo heart failure hai wo pulmonary frank pulmonary edema because of cardiac origin right as hypertension is there not because that this patient was having you know what you call it as a fluid overload because of some salt and water retention over here right so if the question was because of salt and water retention obviously i would have given iv furosemide as the first line but here i have a cardiac origin of pulmonary edema so that's why my dear friend i am going to use iv nitrates yeah muskan that what i am saying nitrates are better not diuretics right okay who is going to give me the right answer please send me your address i will give you a gift also guys think i am giving you extra 10 seconds to think i can zoom the ecg if you have read with this uh, line let me zoom this ecg now So guys what is this patient dealing with can you please tell me what are the finding of the ecg before i jump into the answer you are giving me d c why you don't think for uh, option number a and low molecular weight heparin so let's read this question thrombolysis low molecular weight heparin diclofenac and angio Class three. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? A 35-year-old man presents with mild dyspnea, retrosternal chest pain, which worsens on lying flat and feels relief on leaning forward. So basically, my dear friend, lying flat and feels relieving on leaning forward. This is a very important clue for you. This is going to tell you about one particular condition of the patient. He reports that it starts. So I'm just. Line lighting this line flat and feel deep on leaning forward. This is the important line in whole cardiology, guys. Right? He reports that it started 12 hours earlier and it worsens on deep breathing. So worsens on deep breathing. Another important thing. Last week, patient spoke from common cold. Patient had common cold. I think this is another printing mistake. So guys, I do apologize. Last week, patient had. patient suffered from common cold 
suffered from common cold on examination bp is 138 74 heart rate is 82 per minute ecg is given below what is this ecg is telling you particularly my dear friend if you look at this then what is they are going to tell you about this thing this thing and here you can find in lead 2 particularly lead v3 at least you can find over here so what is this basically this patient is having a saddle shaped st elevation what is this the patient is having a saddle shape st elevation right so this patient is having a saddle shape st elevation now you can see over here v5 v6 you can see over here you can see over here i am just zooming it now so this is a saddle shaped st elevation now where do you find this saddle shaped st elevation you find this in pericarditis you find where beta pericarditis and what is the characteristic feature of this pericarditis that this patient basically their pain worsens on lying flat and their relief on leaning forward this is the characteristic feature and this pain basically worsens on deep breathing nothing to think much they may also give you that in a, not in this question just in general i am talking that they may have an increased level of cardiac markers particularly that of troponin so if you find that there are cardiac level markers or troponins are increased then there might be chances that this patient have developed myocarditis also right that's why you may find that troponin levels to be increased over here now which of the following is the most appropriate treatment so we know this thing non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs are going to be beneficial for a case of pericarditis so diclofenac is going to be the right answer right okay so there is no indication of giving low molecular weight heparin thrombolysis or angioplasty there is no indication as such okay yeah biljinder that was a st elevation saddle shaped st elevation okay very good Yeah, Bajender. Obviously, you can send me your address. Okay, we have options. Times up, guys. Adenosine, digoxin, amiodarone, adrenaline. A thirty-year-old male. It's not male. There are a lot of spelling mistake, guys. I do apologize for the silly spelling mistakes. A thirty-year-old male is admitted with palpitation. What? is otherwise which is otherwise normal is otherwise normal his ecg shows a regular narrow complex tachycardia with a heart rate of 145 per minute so narrow complex tachycardia hai beta palpitation hai this one is very important no bundle branch block or a delta wave is seen so bp is normal this is very important that bp is very normal over here and there is no signs of shock myocardial ischemia or heart failure you try vagal maneuver right as we have just discussed in the previous question i think uh, where we had that question kahan gaya question hamara right yahan ki tha na yaar question adenosin ke upar ha yahan pe ki rotated sinus massage this was the what was the most appropriate question number 18 look at this over here they were asking what was the most appropriate initial therapy and here we discussed about that their patient is going to have a carotid sinus massage now the same question you can correlate over here that what they are saying is this that this patient has gone under a vagal maneuver that this patient has gone under a vagal maneuver which was not helpful in cardioverting this patient which medication needs to be used next 
so i have discussed already that according to the acls guidelines first of all you are going to go for a vagal maneuver then my dear friend you are going to go for adenosine so adenosine is going to be the right answer rest of the drugs digoxin amiodron right they are can be used in the arrhythmias right so they may ask you that how you are going to give adenosine first dose should be of 6 mg very important if it is not reverted then you have to give the second dose of 12 mg bolus you have to increase it by double so you have to give 12 mg bolus my dear friend right please do revise the acls guidelines for tachycardia or the cpr guidelines for acls they are very very important and must know subject for this thing so first do the vagal maneuver if it is not reverted back then go for adeno sin right okay times up guys times up infective endocarditis good faster not faster it's good faster good faster syndrome wagner granulomatosis acute hiv infection okay a 35 year old male male is admitted with fever sweating dry cough he has abused heroin it's not heroin it's heroin basically guys so i really apologize for these silly uh, spelling mistakes for several years and has just started methadone very important lab reports hv is uh, 11.9 tlc is increased what is the normal range of tlc do remember we have discussed already 10 4000 to 10000 right urea is on a little higher side creatinine is okay little higher chest x rays small left sided pleural fusion it's pleural pleural effusion with several nodular densities with a cavity right urine analysis shows blood positive what is the likely cause guys what is the likely cause so guys you are getting confused between option number c and d see guys wagner's granulomatosis or acute hiv infection no first of all do remember this thing this wagner's granulomatosis yes it can present with the um, um, uh, nodular densities or with a cavitatory formation i do agree with this point but it is less likely to be correlated in a case of a drug abuser like this patient is having a drug abuse history so in these drug abusers basically what you go for you go for they cause infective endocarditis and particularly these iv drug abusers they can cause infective endocarditis and the valve involved is what better tricuspid valve the valve involvement is tricuspid valve right and what are the main other features of this thing they can have some infections like patient can present with nausea vomiting anorexia weight loss uh, uh, rigors night sweats right and they have an infective emboli which manifest as a common immune complex disease so when they have developed this immune complex disease this patient can also develop a hematuria that's why this patient is having a 
blood positive in the urine right okay so now once this tricuspid valve is involved what is going to happen there are emboli which can cause patient to have a uh, dyspnea patient to have pleural effusions or patient can you know have some kind of pleuritic chest pain so yes looking at this uh, drug abuse history and uh, patient's uh, clinical feature so the answer is going to be infective endocarditis yeah right guys so guys i wish that you have enjoyed this session and i am pretty i wish that uh, my you will learn a lot of things from this session right and uh, i do expect that majority of you people would try to regain uh, rather uh, you know uh, going into a uh, grabbing the new knowledge you just have to accumulate your previous knowledge and try to revise and revise the things in a beautiful manner right so revision is the only key to success guys do remember medicine is easy but it requires a little bit of patience it requires a little bit of dedication only then the things are going to get simplified for you guys rest i wish you all the best guys there are only a few days countable days or countable hours left for the day to come where you can be the show stoppers and you can show all your efforts all your you know determinations all your hard work which you have been doing from a lot of months and in spite the fact that you have taken mbbs courses to be a wonderful doctors so that day is going to come in a very short time be prepared for that thing right have faith in yourself and i wish you all the best guys thank you very much take care good night thank you very much sir guys